Okay, so the peppers are in the crock pot, and uh, the crock pot is turned on. It's going to be about nine hours. Um, so, I'm going to finish telling my story as I pace around here like I usually do. Uh, picking back up, my dad and mom got back together, and things were reasonably peaceful for a number of years. Well, I say that. Uh, in 1984, my mom and dad worked at the Texoma Lodge, and my dad had a running buddy named Terry. They got drunk one day, and my dad shot a guy in the hand, H-A-N-D, not head. And he was arrested and pretty much let off with a slap on the wrist. Uh, but I don't recall any episodes of him really being abusive to my mom. As a matter of fact... Uh, my relationship with my dad was very good from uh, probably 1982 through, well, basically 1991. Uh, on weekends, we would spend the day watching Channel 39, Long Ranger, and The Rifleman, Bonanza. And during college football season or NFL uh, we would watch a game or maybe two, and then we'd drive over to um, Western End in Tishomingo and eat catfish or chicken fried steak, depending on what day it was. And we'd have a lot of lengthy talks, and I'd teach him what I learned in school, and he'd teach me what he learned in life. And we uh, actually grew pretty close, and I had a good relationship with my dad. Um, in 1991, things started to turn bitter again, and he was beginning to get progressively more and more resentful about things until on June the tw or July the 27th, uh, we had a birthday party for Gerald Morak. Uh, he married my aunt, but I don't call him my uncle because he was my friend first. And we were expecting... Oh, how up at least a hundred people. And my dad and I agreed that we would do security that night, and so we did our drinking the night before. And uh, so we agreed that we wouldn't drink that day. And we went to town that morning to pick up the last items that we would need for this humongous party. Got back, and I laid down to take a nap. And I don't remember exactly who woke me up, but I woke up to somebody shaking my leg and telling me I needed to get up because my dad was getting out of hand, that he was drinking, my cousin had come up and given him some out of hand, and things were getting out of control. I got up, uh, we had just uh, started a band called Flashback at the time. We would have eventually become Empty Pockets and then Gypsy Haven. And uh, we were going to play, but it started raining. And so the rest of the MAD members took that as a great opportunity to go to Norman and visit some strip clubs, something I never had a desire for. So when I told my dad that, that he tore all the, the uh, band flyers off the posts that we had were hanging on, and he called us a bunch of names, and I just walked away from him because I had more problems to deal with than I could handle. Uh, I was sober. There were a bunch of drunk people there. Uh, several fights took place, one including my brother. And that's when it all started. My brother and a guy got into a fight. We broke him up, uh, put the guy in his truck. He tried to start his truck. It wouldn't start, so he had to get out and fiddle with the distributor cap. And my dad comes out, and he fires six shots over our heads. And the sad thing about this, I had become so used to violence and gunplay that it didn't even bother me. And in fact, I even counted the shots. My friend Clayton came up and grabbed the gun and put the barrel in his chest and said, go ahead and shoot me. Uh, but I know that my dad knew he was out of bullets or he would have probably shot him. So my dad goes back in the house and the next thing I hear is him say, does anybody out here think they're a bad motherfucker now? And Gerald Marek said, yeah, Rex, I do. 
and we all hear a shotgun blast. And then the next thing I hear is my sister screaming that my daddy shot my brother. And then my brother gets up and he says, yeah, daddy, you shot me. And he starts running around the house and my sister has to get him and get him into a vehicle because he's bleeding severely. He had the side of the scalp blown off. Uh, Gerald got some BBs in his head. And so we all left. A little bit later, I got to where I could call out to the house and see what was going on. And my grandma answered the phone and she said, oh, Junior, I think Rex has done killed a man. And in fact, that's what happened. He shot a guy that he didn't even really know. He was, he was just at the wrong place at the wrong time. And because of that event, uh, I went through a pure hell that very few people know about. And that hell being that I stayed out in the country during the day alone because my aunt and my and Gerald both worked. And for months I got threatening phone calls, people with death threats, people saying they were going to kill me. They were just looking for an opportunity to take me out because I had my dad's name. And it was a continuous thing for months and months. There were times when I would come home after playing in a club and be scared to death that I would go into my room and find somebody waiting for me because I had a door to the outside in my room and a big, big window that could easily have been opened. And so I spent a lot of time with a lot of anxiety. My dad went to prison from 1991 to 2003. And when he got out, I wanted nothing to do with him and had nothing to do with him until my grandma ended up in the hospital with a heart attack. And I told my dad that I would uh, go down with him to Austin to see my grandma if he would wait long enough for me to get home from the club and that I would come home right then and we could leave by three o'clock. So he agreed and that, that was the first time that we traveled together and we actually started to talk. And I started to build a relationship with him, but I still didn't care for him. I still didn't like him. Now, this is the story I'm going to reward you with. In November of 2004, he came to me and said that the doctors had found a blockage in his arteries and he was going to have to go get an angioplasty. And so I went with him and my mom to the Deaconess Hospital in Oklahoma City, and they were about to do the angioplasty on him, but they came in and said, uh, your kidney proteins show that if we do this procedure, the dye will kill your kidney, so you need to find out what is going on. So he goes back home and goes to his doctor. Uh, his doctor ends up calling me. Face. Zero faces. Oops. Switch off. His doctor ends up calling me and saying, uh, you need to get to the hospital as quick as you can. Your bladder's about to bust. I knew he was talking about my dad, so I said, man, I guess you you got the wrong person. And so I called my dad and told him what they said. Well, he went down, and he came to find out he had a growth on his prostate that was blocking his urethra. But they couldn't do surgery because they didn't know the condition of his heart. And they couldn't determine the condition of his heart because they couldn't put the dye in. So... He lived with us for a while, and man, he would slurp his car. He'd sit at my desk in the mornings, because I worked pretty much through the night. And so he would come in and sit at my desk, and... <sighs> and man, I remember one time telling him, why don't you just stop breathing? And man, I was angry with him. But I started praying for him, not because I wanted him... Not because I was super spiritual or righteous or anything. I wanted him out of my house. I wanted him healthy and out of my house. And I started noticing that every day I prayed for him was a day that I was less angry towards him. That wasn't my intention, God. By two days before Christmas, he had a doctor's appointment and it was snowing. And he said, well, you think we ought to go to the doctor's appointment? I said, well, yeah, you've, I mean, you've driven in worse conditions than this. 
Hell, you can drive down the road to sleep. He did it on the way back to Austin. He was snoring. I said, hey, man, you know, and woke him up. I said, you're asleep. And he goes, no, I'm not. <laughs> but anyway, um, we go down to the doctor's, and the nurse comes in, and she says, well, Mr. Howard, you ought to feel like singing Christmas carols. And he goes, why, because it's snowing? And she goes, no, because your prostate growth has shrunk enough that we can do microsurgery on you, and we won't have to put you out. And so we can remove that growth. And then you can go to Deaconess and have your angioplasty. He went to Deaconess, and the doctor said, I don't know what's going on. You can see here evidence of the scan that shows clear blockage. And you can look at this newest scan, and there is no blockage. And he said, I have no idea what's going on. When I got back, I said, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Dr. God stepped in. But I'm going to tell you something. He wasn't the one that benefited the most from that prayer. I did. I wasn't resentful anymore. I wasn't angry towards him anymore. I didn't hate him. I forgave everything that he ever did, and that was a lot. And he died um, in 2007 on September 18th. And, you know, it didn't affect me the way my mom's death did, but it was still a shock because it was unexpected. But I'll tell you something, six days before he died, me and a friend went over to see him in the hospital and my friend led him in the Lord's Prayer and he accepted Jesus into his heart. So I know he died and went to heaven. And so, that story is to tell you that relationships can be healed if we do it with a pure heart and if we do it with love for one another in our hearts and we can recover from whatever happens to us if we make the effort but it's not going to happen if we don't do anything thanks for listening I know I was supposed to do a video much much sooner than this but uh, anyway I just didn't feel motivated to do it and Maybe I'll get more motivated. Maybe I'll get more likes and on these videos and encouragement to do more because I have a lot to say.